this has been my week of kind of forgetfulness. I can tell you this, it gets worse. <laughs> I can understand that. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of what my day's been like, I was sitting here up until about a minute ago and I realized I don't have a Bible. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm to lead a Bible study, so <laughs> I have it now. But, so my apologies, we might end up having to back up and recircle the wagons a few times during during the uh, the class here, but I'll try to keep you guys on, on track here. Okay. All right, well, welcome to class number three in, uh, in James. And while I'm chatting here, I'm gonna try and get the PowerPoint up here. And let's launch this guy. I'll get back to the start here. All right, there we go. Can everybody see the slides okay? Yes. All right, good deal. If for whatever reason something goes blank or you can't hear me, just wave some arms. You guys are a little tiny, like one inch by two inch square, so <laughs> got to make big movements for me to see you. All right. So uh, just a reminder what our class objectives are here for studying the book of James. It's to gain a working knowledge of the book, uh, to really look at the big picture, um, see some of the background information, identify and define some key words, uh, key phrases, and key concepts. Mm -hmm. The application of, of any Bible study is the so what I call the so what, and that's to locate and uncover how we're going to apply keys that we can gain out of the scripture to. Uh, uh, cause us to be transformed in a way that God wants us to be transformed and ultimately that transformation uh, the end goal is to uh, to get us reconciled with God and to develop a closer relationship with God than we had before we studied. So um, as with all the other classes I'm going to leave some time at the end for questions and I encourage you to um, since we are saving them till the end if you have questions go ahead and jot them down somewhere on your handouts um, so that you remember, and uh, I'd love to, uh, to entertain some questions at the end. Our themes in, in James overall, the, the whole book really talks about faithful action. We saw in chapter one uh, where we discussed uh, what it looked like to demonstrate humble obedience. And uh, we saw that uh, having faith is really involves godly action in chapter two. In chapter three, we'll actually see how we can use our tongue to, uh, to speak blessings. And uh, later on in classes four and five, we'll look at faith and humility and prayer and salvation. I don't want to give any secrets away on that. You'll just have to stay tuned. Review of chapter two. Uh, we saw how faith is definitely godly action. Uh, we saw the trappings of uh, judging incorrectly and, and uh, in, improperly stereotyping um, people. Uh, either so socially or economically uh, in sections one and two. Um, we also saw how uh, using um, mercy uh, in our discernment is a, is a better way, and it wins over a con condemning judgment, um, both personally, how we care for others, um, but also spiritually in our lives, because if we remember from last week how we, um, how we judge others is how God is going to judge us ultimately in the end. So remember to apply lots of mercy. And uh, we saw at the end uh, that complete righteousness uh, has to do with exercising uh, wisdom, taking the knowledge that we have and, and, uh, and humble obedience, doing what God wants us to do. So our subject sentence for chapter two was to show our faith by what we do, how we treat people, and especially how we treat God. Looking ahead to our study for today in chapter three, uh, we're gonna see, again, just a reminder, how we bless God and others with our tongue. Uh, there's, uh, I've broken the chapter up into four divisions. Uh, we're gonna see how God judges teachers. Uh, we're gonna see uh, the big warning there, uh, and uh, just a reminder of how untamable our tongues can be, uh, and that, you know, we have the opportunity to pr produce praise with our tongue or, or not. And, uh, and to see what it actually means to, uh, to let 
what that additional wisdom in chapter 3 is from heaven. So our subject sentence for chapter 3 is that God's peacemakers sow heavenly wisdom using humble, considerate submission. And as a reminder, you have your handouts in front of you, so feel free to jot down notes, um, things that, uh, ideas that strike your fancy or maybe new concepts so that uh, you can remember, remember them and help to uh, kind of burn them into your minds. Our first division here, we'll see how God judges teachers. I encourage you to follow along as we go through uh, chapter uh, chapter three here in your Bibles and on your your handouts, uh, and you can look up at the PowerPoint slides and listen to me. I I really like the uh, you know giving you guys an opportunity to kind of interact and and experience uh, you know different media to uh, to try to keep your attention and and try to put uh, the details here together. So. Before we get any deeper into uh, chapter 3, why don't we go ahead and read it really quick. Uh, James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Not many of you should presume, presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take a ship as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, setting the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Well, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have, en where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. All right. Go on to section one. Verse 1. Have you ever listened to the content of your public and private conversations? Now, how about your self talk? Now, why do you think we hold teachers to a higher moral and ethical standard than other professionals? And is it fair to hold Bible teachers, preachers, and Sunday school teachers to an even higher standard? Well, here in verse 1, we're cautioned to be careful when we teach. Why? Well, because teachers are judged more strictly. Interesting. Well, let's take a look and see what Jesus has to say about some bad teachers in Matthew chapter 23. 
teachers of the law. We're to do everything they tell us. I do not do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. Everything they do is done for people to see. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. Well, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, blind guides. First clean the inside. Outside you appear as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So here we see that, you know, it's teaching is not about trying to look good on the outside. It's about being humble on the inside and trying to have some vision instead of a blind guide, have a spiritual vision as to where, where we're going and to try to live out our faith. You know, so I think what James is trying to teach us in the book of James and in chapter 23 really speaks to the opposite of what we see here for bad teachers. So we all want to strive for that, to try to be a good teacher. And that means that we need to be accountable for our, our actions and our words. And, it, you know, I say all of us. I mean, obviously, I'm teaching here <laughs> uh, today, and you guys are, you know, are partic participating as students. But I think each one of us, you know, we teach others by our actions. I mean, you ever thought about, you know, the many times that you've sat and watched somebody do something or listen to how somebody says, uh, you know, carries on a conversation or deals with the situation. And, uh, you know, we learn from that. You know, we can look at, at these situations and these people and say, well, you know, ask ourselves questions. You know, did that work out good for them? Is that uh, you know, behavior or, you know, words or an attitude that, you know, is going to work out in that situation. And, and do I want to adopt something similar to that in my life? You know, so, you know, we're, we're actually, we learn a lot about human interaction from the people around us, what works and what doesn't work. And I think from a spiritual standpoint, people learn a lot spiritually by watching believers, watching all of us that know what's in the word and to see how we carry ourselves. Are we, um, are we practicing what we preach? Because if we're not, um, it's unfortunate, but true, um, we're gonna frustrate the people around us. You know, you think about it, when you see somebody that's, that's not, uh, they're talking the talk, but not walking the walk, it's kind of frustrating for us. And we don't wanna be that point of frustration for other people. So our principle here in verse one is that teachers will be judged more strictly. And I put all of us in this cat category as a teacher because whether we're leading a class or just leading our lives, um, people are learning from our example, gauging what we believe by the words that we use and how we use them. Remember our focus of this chapter is to find ways to bless God and others with our tongue. So for our call to action, I've got a question down here, which is a great one for each one of us to ask ourselves. What do I need to get right with God so that I can teach? What do I need to do to get right with God so that I can teach? Looking ahead to <clears throat> division two. The untamable tongue. And it's a big warning here. I mean, we need, I really think we need to uh, realize here, we, our family was talking about this verse uh, this past Sunday, is that uh, to view our tongue as a wild animal. And, uh, you know, even though we may have uh, decades of experience uh, trying to tame this wild animal and having some uh, relative success of it, uh, <clears throat> that wild animal um, can sometimes have a mind of its own, um, so to speak, and uh, can uh, can get out of the cage and uh, and, and cause some uh, 
uh, be disobedient and, and cause some damage. Uh, and our, our tongues are, uh, need to be treated similarly. <clears throat> so do you feel like you can effectively control your tongue? Or can you see recent episodes of less than optimal control? Uh, maybe some inappropriate comments about others, uh, some gossip, uh, you know, perhaps a little bit of potty mouth, or some angry rants. Uh, here's a good one. How about sarcasm or criticism? You know, how many, how often do you use your tongue to praise others and to praise God? or to give a word of encouragement to someone, or to, uh, to teach someone in a nurturing way. Well, <clears throat> again, we all need to approach this with humility. You know, we stumble, each one of us stumble. Um, we all struggle with our tongue in, in different ways. It, you know, we may, it, it may be that we don't do any of the negative things that are listed here with our tongues, but we don't do any of the positive things either. Um, or you could be like me, it's you do the negative things and very little of the positive things. So, um, you know, keep in mind, we're, we are all in this together. Uh, and it's, uh, it's hard for us to keep our tongue in control. Keep in mind that this instruction here, I really think, you know, the chapter may be dealing um, specifically with teachers. This instruction is for every one of us. We, we all... We all have this issue. On to the next slide here. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we think about our tongue. Um, our little tongue may have a, a tiny little input into, into our bodies um, or into our society, but it can generate huge results. And I think about this verse when a um, few times that I've been on top of a horse, uh, Abigail can attest to this as well as anybody else in the room that's ridden a horse, is it has very gentle and um, very tiny movements of, uh, of a bridle on a horse. You can, you can put pressure on a bit in the horse's mouth and get the horse to do dramatic things uh, with that, uh, that bridle and bit if you know what, um, what you're doing. Well, our tongues, uh, even though they're little, with the tiniest of movement, can, uh, can also uh, determine our course. So you look at a ship, kind of the same thing. You get these huge ships and these tiny little rudders. Uh, you make a little, very little uh, uh, adjustment in the angle of the rudder, and you can steer that ship uh, wherever you want to go. We see this in, in verse 4. You think about it. I mean, you can steer, you've got a ship out on, on the ocean, and you can either steer it into a storm or steer it around a storm. Uh, you can run it into the rocks, uh, or you can head it out into, into deep, um, calm water. And uh, we can do the same things, the same thing with our lives uh, by how we use our tongue. Well, let's see what happens when we get off course. So the tongue, this small part of our body is capable of making huge boasts. And if you think about it, anybody in the audience play with fire? You like making fires in the fireplace or burning yard waste? No, no hands, I do. <laughs> I like making fires, I love playing with fires. Um, and we did a lot of that when I had uh, acreage back in Ohio. And what I found is that you can, you can get a pretty big fire going with just uh, a, a little bit of energy from one small match <clears throat> and some dry material. Uh, I, can, I can make a whole pile of green brush uh, start on fire and get dangerously large uh, in, in, in short period. And our tongue, the boasting of our tongues can have the same effect on the environment around us. The tongue is a fire 
a world full of evil among the body parts. It can corrupt the whole person. <clears throat> can set a person's whole life on fire. And the tongue can be set on fire by hell. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> to take a look at that, I think we need to understand that the translate, Bible translations are, are a little rough here. Um, but we need to keep in mind, you know, go back to the original word for hell, and it's Gehenna, which was a place outside Jerusalem where um, people would dump their trash, and they would light it on fire. So you had this big trash bin that was burning all the time because there was an endless supply of trash uh, to be used as fuel for this fire. So if you think about it from the standpoint of our tongue, this little tiny fire, um, which uh, has an endless supply of garbage <laughs> to, uh, to keep us burning, and, uh, and also has the ability to, uh, to light a lot of stuff on fire. So King David uh, knew all too well the dangers of an unbridled tongue. We see his struggle here in Psalm 39. And King David uh, said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me while I meditated. The fire burned. And then I spoke with my tongue. So <clears throat> have anybody... Uh, ever tried this this tactic, you know, when you know you're, you just don't have anything good to say, and if you open your mouth, it's just going to make a bad situation worse. So you decide to just bite your tongue and keep your mouth closed. And then after a short period of time, you can't take that much longer, and you just open your mouth, and you make the situation worse. Anybody ever done that before? Show of hands. Yeah, <clears throat> guilty as charged. Again, we're, uh, we're in this together. And, um, King David, thankfully, uh, recorded for us that he struggled with this. But he also had a solution to, uh, to ask the Lord to set a guard over his mouth and to keep watch over the door of his lips. And I think this is a prayer that we can pray too. We have it recorded for us in Psalm 141.3. And uh, you can jot that down on your uh, these two verses down on your handouts if you'd like to refer to them later. I don't, oh, I do have, <clears throat> I actually do have them written down. One of them have a little puzzle uh, for it in uh, division two there. <clears throat> so, you know, what's the principle here in this section? The principle is we're not able to tame our tongue and to keep it from doing evil. Uh, you know, we need God's help to, uh, to keep us on course. And, uh, you know, we really shouldn't get frustrated when we struggle with that, uh, you know, to keep leaning on, on the Lord uh, more and more and uh, pray for his help and teaching us how to have a little bit more self-control. <clears throat> and our focus here as we, we walk away and we think about this is, is to, to find ways that we can use our tongue and bless God and others. And one way I think that's uh, that's uh, really applicable um, both for the people around us and, and for God is to become expert, expert apologizers. You know, we, um, we have a habit of sinning <laughs> and making mistakes uh, often, and oftentimes, you know, we wrong the people around us or we sin against God. So these four um, key phrases, I forget where I got them, but uh, um, they're called some of the four most powerful short phrases in the world. And the first one is, I'm sorry. To just apologize when we mess up. Um, and when we know that we're wrong, to say that, I was wrong. I, I can remember the Happy Days episode where Bonzi is, uh, they're trying to get him to admit that he made a mistake. Anybody ever remember seeing that Happy Days episode? Okay, I'm the only crazy one, but he, he couldn't say the words. He could just get the W and the rest of the, the word wouldn't come out. 
Um, those are three of the hardest words to say, a as is the next three, please forgive me. You know, if we're really truly concerned about, uh, we want to be concerned about those around us, um, we need to get comfortable asking them for forgiveness um, because we want to get comfortable asking God for forgiveness as well, apologizing to him, to letting him know, to being honest with God and to tell him that we realize that we're wrong and to share with those around us and with our Heavenly Father that we love, we love him. Those are powerful ways that we can bless God and others with our tongue. So on to Division 3 in verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> Producing praise or not? See, we'll see here that we should not curse men with the same tongue that we use to praise God. Easier said than done. So let me ask you a question here. Have you ever ruined the atmosphere at a family gathering or at, the, or at your workplace or in your neighborhood or at church or your meeting? How about at home or how about in the car on the way to church? Well, I've kind of been guilty of, I think, every one of those. Um, by deciding to use uh, words that were not carefully chosen. So, uh, another question. How often do you go out of your way to praise God? To give encouragement to those closest to you? You know, those are, those are hard. I don't necessarily feel comfortable about my answers to any one of those three questions, but... Uh, they're definitely valuable questions that, that we all can ask ourselves from time to time. So man tames these, animals, sea creatures, birds, reptiles. Man's figured out how to train all of those. He can't figure out how to train, tame his tongue. See here, it's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. See, the problem is, is we're cursing God's likeness with the same tug, tongue that we praise the Lord. And uh, this should not be. You know, God, back in Genesis, uh, with his angels, created man in his own image and his likeness. And who are we to, to think that it's acceptable to, uh, to let one of his likenesses have the wrath of our tongue? It's just, it's completely out of place, but I know I do it. I feel justified sometimes, and it's wrong. As we see here um, in verse 10, you know, this shouldn't, we should not praise and curse with the same mouth. So I would say, if you do curse others with your mouth, don't give up. Just uh, work a little harder trying to, uh, to praise more than you're cursing. And hopefully, with a steady progress, you can elim eliminate the uh, the negative aspect of that, or at least um, get it uh, better in control in your lives. And I know for me, this is um, this is probably one of the largest spiritual challenges for me is to to really um, work hard to use my tongue in a positive way, um, especially with my family at the end of a hard day when, you know, things are stressful at home or, or we're going somewhere, there's, you know, for me, there's, you know, certain uh, situations that are triggers. And, uh, you know, you may find the same thing uh, for you. And, you know, it's my encouragement that, you know, you realize, hey, we're in this together. And, uh, you know, you can think about, gosh, I'm struggling with this too. And I'll bet, you know, uh, you know, some of the others are, are as well, and, and uh, you know, maybe you can find an encouragement to, uh, to try a little harder. All right, on to, uh, on to verse 11. You need to focus on speaking only sweet, refreshing, life-giving words. You know, can, uh, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Have you ever seen that where you've got a spring that's, uh, you know, 
one minute it flows fresh water and the ne next minute it flows salt water. It's like, no, it's a, a spring is either good or it's bad or it starts out good and it goes bad and it never really reverts. So, you know, to think about this from in the natural world, you know, we don't see fig trees bearing olives or grapevines bearing figs, you know, and we don't see uh, one spring producing two different kinds of water. It just not, does not occur in, in nature. Um, if you think about, you know, water and the importance of water in the Bible uh, and where Jesus used uh, situations with water to, uh, you know, to teach. Um, you know, one com comes to mind with me that's kind of appropriate uh, for this, this section. And it's, a, it's regarding the Samaritan woman at the well. We're not going to turn there, but if you want to jot down John chapter 4 and take a look at it later, um, you'll, you'll kind of see, but he's, he's uh, trying to uh, kind of convert and, and get the Samaritan woman to a, a, a point of uh, repentance and it's accepting him as the, the son of God and teaching her how to, how to worship, um, both in spirit and truth. And he tells her that if, he, if she were to ask him for a drink of water, he would give her living water. And if she drank that living water, that her uh, living water would spill out from her and she would never, ever be thirsty again. And so, you know, you picture on this as, as if we're to use our mouths to, um, to produce good water, that this living water should be spilling out of our, our mouths and, uh, and, and affecting, you know, others, you know, having this living water from God spill out from our tongues and share the gospel message, uh, the good news, the, the merciful message of, of God to, uh, to those around us hopefully an encouraging picture for you. There's a, there's a question on the slide uh, or on the handout um, for this verse. But we see here Paul's teaching on the tongue, the Apostle Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 4, encouraging us to not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Well, to be a help, to, to benefit, to build others up. And then he continues in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 3. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, put that out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Now, I like a good joke, <laughs> and I like to say silly things, but boy, every time I read this verse, um, you know, it causes me to think about trying to uh, say things that are, you know, that are thankful and giving thanks to, to God and being a praise to those around me. So again, good verses to jot down in our, on your handout. We see uh, continued teachings from Jesus on, on the tongue. I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. That's from Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37. The words we use every day are, are getting recorded um, forever. This was before digital media. Um, we're we're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to have to give an account for, for what we said. So, uh, you know, now's the time to get busy asking for forgiveness and repenting and trying to for all of us to try to use our tongues in a, in a better way. So the principle here is we should not curse men with the same tongue we use to praise God. Our focus is learning how to bless God and others with our tongue here. So our call to action here is straight out of Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Again, it's the Apostle Paul. It's encouraging us uh, with these words. Let our conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer everyone. To season each one of our words with just the right amount of salt, so that it tastes really good to everybody around us. 
So our prayer here for all of us is for God to give us the grace and the salt we need so that our tongues produce amazing flavors of praise and blessing. Think about how just the right amount of salt can make food taste amazing. Well, it can also season with the salt of God. Our, our, uh, our words can taste amazing to those around us. So on to Division 4, uh, verses 13 through the end of cha the chapter, uh, where we're, we're going to see wisdom from heaven, and that is humble deeds, selfless consideration of others, and that's what heavenly wisdom is. Now, before we, we talk about verse 13, let's ask you a question. Do you struggle with bitterness? with envy, with selfish ambition, or with pride? And what help do you need to transform these struggles into heavenly wisdom lived out as pure peacemakers, um, considerately submissive, givers of mercy, bearers of good fruit, and impartial merciful judges of others and of ourselves? What? What can what do you need in order to do that? Well, and we get some encourage here, encouragement here in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Now, therein lies a great amount of encouragement. He also gets some encouragement from King Solomon. Uh, back in the Old Testament, King Solomon had, uh, he was King David's son, and his, uh, one of the responsibilities that was given to him by, um, by his father and ultimately by God was to build a temple um, where God's people could come to Jerusalem and worship the one true God in the one way that God had had called them to uh, to worship him in, and so Solomon was was uh, faithful to uh, to this inst instruction. He built the temple, and he had this wonderful worship service to dedicate the temple. And he had um, said this magnificent prayer uh, during this worship service. And he was back home in his uh, his castle and uh, his palace. And, and uh, while he was there. Uh, God spoke to him, you know, most likely through an angel. But here's what, here's some of what God said to him, and we have rec recorded for us in Second Chronicles chapter 7. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So all we need to do is to call on the name of the Lord to humble ourselves seek his face, to turn from our wicked ways, he will forgive us our sins. That's, that's powerful. Even Jesus encourages us to be humble. He's telling his audience that the Son of Man, meaning himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many can't serve others unless you're humble. In the second half of uh, 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter instructs us, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Well, you know, there we have an example of what humility, you know, can do and what it looks like, but, you know, here's what it doesn't look like, the opposite of humility harboring bitter envy, harboring self, selfish ambition in our hearts, boasting about it, denying the truth about it. Such wisdom, it's anti-wisdom. It does not come down from heaven. It's earthly. It's unspiritual. And it's in direct opposition to God. See, I firmly believe that at the core, it's selfishness that ultimately e leads to evil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. And we serve a good God, a God of order. 
And it's only when selfishness gets in the way that that disorder gets disrupted or that order gets disrupted and turns into disorder. Wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. The heavenly wisdom is all good. It's impartial, it's sincere. So on to harvesting righteousness. You know, if we think about it, God is trying to call us into a place where, where we can gain righteousness, not by our own efforts, but because he wants us to have it, he will give it to us. It just requires us to faithfully obey. So there's encouragement here at the end of James chapter 3 is that peacemakers who sow in peace will raise a harvest of righteousness. So if we go about trying to create peace and to sow that peace, to lay the seeds of peace, and how we use our tongue, how we humble ourselves in front of others, um, we're guaranteed that we're going to harvest righteousness because of it. Well, where else do we see this teaching? The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6, the one who sows peace, sows to please his sinful nature. From that nature will reap destruction. So we want to sow our own selfish sinful nature, we're going to reap destruction. If we sow to please the Spirit instead, from that Spirit we will reap eternal life. We also find uh, further encouragement from the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. And this is my prayer, that, you love, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So our principle here is that humble deeds, selfless, selfless consideration of others is, is heavenly wisdom. Our focus here is to bless God and others with our tongue. We do that by demonstrating humility with our deeds, with our words, being selfless when we consider others. So call to action here is for each one of us to pray to God you know, God, help me sow peace with my tongue and hands so that I harvest righteousness from God. That's a great prayer to, uh, uh, for us to say, put it in your own words and uh, think about it often. Oops, back up here. Uh, any questions on this, this week's material? You mentioned Gehenna, but when does when does Sheol come in? Say say again, please. Back, back a few slides. Can you mention about hell? Yes, sir. You mentioned the word Sheol. You mentioned the word Gehenna. When does when does Sheol come in? Hmm, that's um that's a good question. Sheol is actually a uh, a term that's uh, it's a Hebrew term. So we're going to find that in the Old Testament, but typically in the New Testament, where in a lot of translations, we'll see the word hell. Um, it's coming from the Greek for, for Gehenna. Does that answer your question okay? Would you uh, flash that, the last screen just before this one one more time? I sure can. Uh, this one here? Yes. Okay. Um, the next, the next one. Uh, the one before this one. No. Am I going the right way? Okay. Okay. Sure. Gotcha. Okay. 
All right, sweet. Any other questions? Uh, I, I uh, kind of had a bit of a question, banking off of that question about Gehenna and Sheol. Yes. Uh, maybe as, you know, it says, uh, I think it was Matthew 23, 6, you know, as the fires of hell. And did I know if that should be translated, since we don't believe in a literal hell, uh, that should be the fires of the grave? But that, but you're saying that Sheol, that hell, you know, we think some people think you go to hell, but you're saying, I think your doctrine is that you go to the grave and not to hell. Gotcha. And where's that in Matthew again, Susie? I think it was uh, 23, 6. I've got verse 6, but it must have been Matthew, or maybe it's Matthew 6. Well, the, the, uh, uh, Jane noticed that there's a typo in the handout. On that, on that Matthew 23. Oh, it really should, it was on the screen, correct? It was it's Matthew, Matthew 6, 23. our handout hand is supposed to be. Yeah, so oh, okay. handout it says Matthew 6. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's Matthew 6 and not 23. No, no, it's actually 23. It oh, it is 23. He had, he had it right on the screen. Oh, it was I wrong see. on the handout. 23, okay. Let's go. Okay. Okay, so then it was, I think it is then Matthew 23, I'll look, but Matthew 23, uh, 6, that refers to, um, no, that's not it. I'll find it here. Or maybe it's James, verse, it was one of the chapters in James, verse 6. You know, it's, it's, you're telling us as the fires of hell, it must have been in James. Yeah, yeah it was James, it was James, uh, James chapter 3, and... Yeah. Now I got it. Sorry about that typo, guys. Um, well, I, the, Susie, the, the point that I got anyway out of what Brian was saying on that verse was that it's set on fire by Gehenna, right? So it, it, it's almost like James is using a more literal sense because Gehenna is the garbage dump, right? Wow. So this is your tongue is set on fire by the garbage dump. Yes. But All the garbage gets dumped right. and it yeah, comes out of your mouth. You know, it, so he's not really talking about the fate of people so, who are so, condemned. Right. It's really not the, not the subject. The subject like, I just read the words. Um, yeah, yeah so, word right, so he's, so using, not, he's using yeah, it as the literal garbage dump, not as a figure for yeah. a place of destruction. Right. All right. So <laughs> we got the slide. It took a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, Susie, I really think that um, that it just James is just using this garbage dump as an example of of how the tongue, um, when not used to uh, to bless and praise, uh, can not only set a huge pile of garbage on fire, but can it can also set itself on fire in in the process. Yeah, that's a great illustration. I mean, a magnificent. I would just kind of more literally know, wanting to know if that word, you know, hell was translated grave or, I guess, uh, you know, Sheol. I always thought Sheol, hell and Sheol, and that was like a literal grave. Got uh, it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, garden. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the word, the word is Gehenna, which is the garbage. And the other yeah. word is totally different. Shield, it's just a lot that the translators call them both hell. So we're not talking about shield at all in any of these verses. These yeah. are all what, what I can do, Susie, is because I don't, I don't have, I didn't do a word study in my notes. So give me the week to kind of look it up and I'll do a little sidetrack uh, discussion on this at the beginning of next week's class. Okay. And we'll just, we'll talk about, we'll take a look at the, the word that's used here in James 3, verse 6. And just see where else it's used in the Bible and just kind of get a good background on the word. Okay. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank All right. You. Yep. I'm going to, and since my mind is not um, really here, I'm going to grab a note card and I'm going to write that down. While you're doing that, I'm going to hand out your second handout. Is that all right? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Paul. All right, let me get back down to where I was here.
Right. So let's see. Okay, so you know, just a little refresher. We do Bible study to, to uh, provide knowledge, understanding, but more, most importantly, to uh, figure out how to apply this great wisdom to our lives. And reminder, Second Timothy chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen, that all parts of Scripture are God breathed. They're useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness, so that we're thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we're to do something with this word, not just learn it, but uh, apply it. So as we study the Bible, um, we just want to, to get the simple message um, uh, to our minds uh, in a clear and brief way. Uh, we're not trying to be uh, brilliant or original here. We're just trying to understand what it is that God's trying to teach mankind. And uh, as we're, we're uh, trying to put the puzzle together to uh, enjoy the ride. Uh, last week, uh, last couple weeks, we... Uh, we talked about study tools one and two um, to uh, come up with content, which would be 10 to 20 items uh, that answer what is this portion of scripture about, and, uh, and then take those 10 to 20 items and group them uh, into sections that are, um, that are similar or address the, the, uh, the same um, type of topic, similar to what I've done with these chapters. And then, um, then the next step that we'll learn tonight is to take these four, these divisions that we've made in the subject sentences that um, describe the divisions and try to piece them together to, uh, to come up with one subject sentence for the, for the overall uh, portion of, of scripture. And this is, for me, this is the hardest step um, because it's, it's very hard to take all this information for me and just to get it into a brief um, you know, 10 to 12 word uh, sentence. Uh, and if you see on your, your hand out there, you know, they'll say, you know, try to keep it to 10 words. It's hard. It's a challenge. I usually, you know, a little disclaimer here. I usually just try to make the sentence and then I count the words and I'll see if I can hone, hone it down and try and get it closer to 10 words. Um, and if I can't, I just kind of leave the sentence the length it is. And most often times for me, I end up with a 15 word sentence. So if you run a little, little wordy, <laughs> that's okay. Um, what I wanna do is see how much time we have. Uh, I'm gonna try and pull up uh, something else here. Bear with me. Uh, All right, I'm going to share with you guys my uh, if I can get back to you. Okay. All right, I'm going to share this with you guys. But here's my my homiletic. So I've got my my content. Uh, here for James chapter three, broken down, you know, by verse, and I have more than 20, probably have about 30 items there. Uh, here's my section sentences. And then typically what I'll do is I'll take, you know, words like, uh, you know, teachers and judged, uh, you know, tame, tongue, evil, uh, curse, uh, praise God, you know, humility, selfless, heavenly wisdom. And then I try to put that into uh, a subject sentence uh, here, which I call a summary sentence, is section three. And, and this, is what, this is the basis that I use to, uh, to put today's class together, you know, our subject sentence, God's peacemaker, so heavenly wisdom, uh, using humble and considerate submission. So hopefully that kind of gives you guys a little bit of an idea of uh, what it kind of looks like from my end um, on that. Any questions about creating subject sentences? Could you email us a copy of, of what you just showed us? Uh, yes, I can. Um, if you, um, Paul, would you be able to share my email with Patricia? Or actually, or Patricia, because I have my email down here um, at the end. 
as well. I'll show you. It's base. It's my name, Brian Adam Ross. The number eighty eight at gmail dot com. But it'll it'll come up here down here and just yeah, ask me. And I'll share um, you know basically anything that I have uh, electronically. These handouts, the PowerPoint presentations, my study notes. I'd be more than happy to just let me know what what you'd like. Okay. All right, so um, our homework for this week, if you so choose to, uh, to sign up for it, and I would highly encourage that you, um, you try to do um, some, if not all of this, is to re at a minimum read chapter four, just so you um, uh, can get a little flavor for what we're gonna be talking about next week. Uh, try to come up with 10 to 20 points of contact content. Um, try to divide those into two to four sections um, that seem to make logical sense to you. And then for each one of those sections, um, try to create a, uh, from each one of those sections, uh, try to create a uh, subject sentence for the, for the divisions, and then use those division sentences to, uh, to create a subject sentence. Um, for me, just to give you an idea, is this, this takes a long time. I think for some people they can do something like this in, in an hour or so. It usually takes me a few hours to, uh, to do this. So I split it up and I may you know, work on it for 15 or 20 minutes a, a, a night. Um, but uh, yeah, whatever works for you. Did, uh, was, did anybody uh, uh, do any of the homework for this week? We did. All right, how, how far did you get? Were you able to uh, uh, create your divisions and come up with division sentences? Well, um, what, I, what I really did was I, uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot, hopefully not embarrassing you too much here. The question, what is the principle in our call, call to action? Mm -hmm. Timothy 3.15, that all scripture is God-breathed. Um, I just, basically what I did was I answered the questions. What's, what is this about? And, um, all right. Well, I answered that. We are not able to tame our tongues. Pray for help. Um, okay. um, well, let's see. I and, did. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I added, what is the print? Yeah, like, what is the principle on um, we should curse, we should not yeah. curse men with the same mm -hmm. tongue as we bless others. Um, and then I wrote down Matthew 12. 3637 for some reason. Or did you write that down and I copied it? Oh, either way. Maybe I copied that for you. Um, and then on what is the principle of um I think that's right now. Call on the Lord to forgive us for our oh, that, that's Okay, I got it now. Gotcha. This is what I did. I'm not so sure I created a vision, but I kind of answered the question. Yep, After that's all right. Did, well, the, the bottom line on this is that, um, you know, whatever you do when you're um, when you're trying to study is is if you can condense down and summarize the you know the main points and get some uh, some sort of action plan uh, you know that's a call to action out of it. It's uh, you've uh, you, you've done uh, done good. So keep up the good work. Uh, here's my email address, um, Pat. So if you want to send me an email and just let me know what uh, what you're uh, uh, what you're after as far as uh, info, I'll be more than happy to forward that on to you.
Any uh, any final questions from you guys? Uh, just thanks. I mean, it's really needed. It's so relevant and pertinent. It is. Yeah. Though, though yeah. I never personally struggled with this issue. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm with you. But I'm sure at some future date I can benefit from it. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Keep keep up the good effort. Well, um, before before I, I leave here, how about we bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for blessing us with this time that we've had uh, together. And we just ask that as we um, as we leave our, our time together and we go our separate ways to go back home and interact with those around us and um, uh, where others can see us, that you remind us of these truths, uh, this heavenly wisdom that you brought to us in James chapter three, and that it will be an encouragement to us to, uh, to do your will, to serve and worship you, um, to humbly uh, become servants to those around us and to let your gospel message pour out of us like that living water poured out of your, your, your son, Jesus. Be with us this week and, and we pray that uh, until your son returns that you keep each one of us safe safe and eager and desiring to uh, to serve and worship and understand you more each and every day as we we look forward to uh, to that day when we can meet meet jesus face to face it's through him we pray all these things amen you all have a great evening i'm sorry i ran over a little bit but uh have a blessed night stay dry and and lord willing we'll see you next week thank you thank you, thank you all right you're welcome bye-bye <laughs>